Okay, um, my name is Kevin Dorm, and uh, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm from America. Um, I work for the uh, Partner Channel in the Americas, and uh, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, our, one of our new products, Records Management 2.0, and uh, some interesting things that you can do with it. So, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what Records Management is and where it came from, and what it does. Are, are there records managers here in the audience? I have A1. Does everybody else know what records management does or what it's for? Okay. Um, so this is a picture of the Library of Alexandria, which was built about 300 BC, they think. And uh, unhappily, this is a recreation of what it looked like because it doesn't exist anymore, and happily it was destroyed in a fire, along with all of the documents that it contained. And they say that the library actually contained most of the knowledge of the world at the time. So that's why records are, have been around, and they're really important to keep safe, so uh, they don't get destroyed if uh, Caesar sets his boats on fire and it happens to spread to your library. So over time, Records have been kept manually, like this, which uh, was uh, fairly tedious. It, it wasn't easy, and it uh, really wasn't very fun either. So now we have more modern systems to keep track of our records. So uh, what do you do with a records management system? Well, um, you might need to have a records management system because you have uh, important business processes that you need to track and be able to report on and uh, uh, hold uh, records for uh, other purposes, such as uh, pharmaceutical companies. You might need to keep uh, records for compliance purposes. That's a big area of uh, uh, things that you do with a records management system. A, a lot of governments like to know that you're complying with the laws and that type of thing. And you're often required to keep records for a certain amount of time past uh, the time that you're actually using them for your business. In addition, um, you often use a records management system to assist lawyers with e-discovery and litigation. So um, records management systems have features built in. Well, all of a sudden, everybody came in. <laughs> so let me stop for a sec. Um, so records management systems have features built in so that you can easily freeze records that uh, lawyers are using to, uh, in a current legal case, and uh, then release them and get rid of them later. So, well, let's talk a little bit about Alfresco records management in particular. So, Alfresco actually started in uh, 2005, as you probably know. So, we often used to use these little pedal icons that show what the pieces of Alfresco were. And we started off with the primary pieces that were document management and web and that type of thing. So in 2009, John Newton decided to write a records management application. And uh, it was kind of interesting because he wrote it, I think, by himself, more or less. And then we got it certified as DOD compliant. So the DOD compliance means that it can be used for a lot of government applications in the United States. But the problem there is that the DOD standard was actually hard-coded into the implementation that he wrote. And so the DOD standard specified that there were only three la layers of uh, hierarchy, folder hierarchy, that you could use to uh, store records. So we had a lot of people tell us that wasn't really good enough to run their business on, and what they really wanted was an expanded hierarchy. So this year, my colleague Roy Weatherall in the back um, pretty much fully refactored records management, and it's been released as a, another new package that uh, came out last August. And uh, so it's got an expanded file plan now where you can have any level of hierarchy that you want to. But uh, one of the really interesting pieces of it is that, uh, so it's got multi-layer file support. Um, if you saw Roy's talk yesterday, there's a lot of other 
good stuff that's coming along. But the really cool part of it is that it's been refactored sort of under the covers, and it's very customizable and very extensible now in the way that the rest of Alfresco is, um, using the same types of models that uh, the rest of Alfresco uses, which wasn't really possible with the previous implementation. So that makes it easy and fun. So um, first off, let's talk about how you install an upgrade to uh, 2.0. So if you're using a 2.1 implementation, is anybody using 2 or, or uh, 1.0 rather? Okay. Have you upgraded to 2.0? OK. Um, so if you upgrade from a 1.0 to a 2.0 um, installation, there's a couple of things to know. Um, first of all, there's a version dependency on 4.02. It doesn't work with any version prior to that because some refactoring of the actual core repository had to be done in order to uh, support some of the things that, that RM does now. And uh, unhappily, there's a problem with the way the installer works in 4.1.1. So if you're trying to install it on that particular version, you'll have to do something special. Um, if you're installing it after that, 4.1.2 or later, you'll be fine. Um, some additional tips are there's uh, also a dependency on the search engine. The initial version of 2.0 didn't support the solar search engine. And uh, you had to lu use Lucene with it. So if nobody's really using that release right now, you probably haven't run into that. Um, but the newest version that was released last week, 2.0.1, does support Solar. And you can get that uh, version currently. So if you're upgrading from 1 to 2, there's a couple of things to know about that. What you do is you apply the you upgrade you know, the core repository. Then apply the 2.0 AMP file to uh, the, the 4.0 WAR file. Um, first of all, you have to pick an Alfresco version, as we just talked about, that supports RM, so 4.02 or later. And if uh, you're applying it to the specific version that I talked about, you have to use the uh, force option there. And then you just install the new 4.0 WAR. The, uh, if there's an existing RM site, it detects that and preserves it. There's a change in the data model that uh, record series aren't used anymore. So the old hierarchy for the DOD model was there's a record series, a uh, uh, record uh, category, and then a record folder. The series has been removed. It's deprecated. But uh, any series that you have will be converted to a, essentially a, a dead object, but it'll still be there. So uh, it's pretty easy, and it uh, works uh, pretty flawlessly for you. So let's talk about the metadata now that you can uh, set up inside of the, the records manager. There's actually two ways to extend the metadata now in the 2.0 product. The first way to do that is to use a uh, dynamic thing that's built into the management console. And that was actually present in the 1.0 release. It allows you to define a piece of metadata and attach it to one of the RM record types. And you can set that up so that it's anything that you want it to be. Under the covers, that implementation has been changed. And I'll talk about something that means for you in a minute. Um, Secondly, now you can extend the content model itself, which you weren't able to do very easily previously. The uh, metadata itself, the dynamic metadata um, you set on this screen here inside of the record manager, which uh, allows you to select one of the primary objects there. And then you can uh, add in. Uh, a definition for a piece of metadata that you would like to store. So the content model now allows you to um, 
use these objects here as bases for um, objects that you would like to extend. So there's a container model. Uh, there are models for records, which uh, is probably where you would do most of the extension points. And then there's some other processing objects, including the primary file plan, which is the big record structure that you define to uh, store your records into. There's also a custom content model now that's based on the primary uh, content model. The custom content model is still for the Department of Defense that we supported before. And uh, it contains an, it's, it's really a really good reference point to use if you're going to try to do any kind of extensions to uh, the records management uh, model or anything else actually because it's its own little contained model and it can be applied as a kind of a separate thing now. So here's what the container model looks like. There's a container that's modeled on a folder, and so the, the containers basically just let you uh, store things into them. The uh, gray things at the bottom here are aspects. So there's a bunch of aspects that uh, RM uses to specify various different things, and uh, you can see how all those work if you actually look at the model itself. You can get at these things, by the way. If you take the AMP file, and unzip it, all of these things are inside of the, the AMP, so you can just take a, the AMP apart and take a look at how things work. The uh, container has a couple of subclasses. One's a record category, and the other is the file plan itself. So uh, I'll talk more about the file plan in a second. The category is the primary place where you store records, and that's where you specify something called a disposition schedule. The disposition schedule is uh, how you tell the records management software how long to keep something and what to do with a record when it's completed, its uh, life cycle. And then there's also a record folder, which uh, is a bit different than how a category works and uh, has some additional types of uh, attribution. And as I said, the record series is depreciated. So the actual record model looks like this. Records are defined as aspects. So aspects have these uh, pieces of data associated with them. And then there's some other aspects that you can actually associate along to a record. So the important piece here is this thing called record metadata. If you're gonna define your own content model, you extend from the record metadata aspect as the parent, and uh, then the RM system will actually recognize that that's a new piece of, or a new type of record. And I'll show you a little bit of how that works in a minute. And then there's a couple of other things here that uh, have to do with how the RM software looks at different types of records. In addition, there's a record type called a non-electronic component. So that's if you wanted to store records that were uh, present in a box or some other place that's not, uh, not actually filed electronically, like a file cabinet. Some companies have, uh, when they do a record search for like a, a uh, legal uh, notification, for example, have to go through a lot of different places to find records. And, one of the things that uh, Roy is working on for one of the future releases is, is better control over uh, records that are not filed electronically. And that's, uh, that'll be based on this object. So here's the DOD model now that's defined based on the record metadata aspect. So each one of those is actually defined as an aspect now too. So this is the model that was defined previously. There were four different types, and you can associate each one of these types to a file or an email or something that you're putting into the records management system. So that just gives you some additional metadata that uh, is important for uh, the government to uh, keep track of. And so if you wanted to define your own uh, metadata, this is what you would do, is you would define an aspect 
that's based on the record metadata aspect, put your um, metadata into that aspect, and then it shows up and you can use it to uh, store your additional metadata for whatever purpose you need to have. So that's uh, when you apply those, this is what it looks like in the user interface. The uh, record types show up here, and you can see sort of the little buttons that are up at the top. So what happens is, is when you declare a file as a record, you're, you actually upload it up it, into uh, records management, you get a selector where you can tell it what type of record it should be declared as. And so you can pick one of these buttons and it associates that aspect to it on the way into the repository. And then uh, once you get it into the repository, you can see at the bottom here, below the kind of gray area there, that this is one that I defined as a PDF record, and you get the additional metadata fields uh, available in the metadata as well. So if you want to create a custom type, like I said, basically what that does is it just adds uh, type-specific metadata to a particular type of record. So you can add as many of those as you want to to the system. And it's a little bit easier in terms of grouping and specification than adding in the dynamic metadata, which goes on to all of the records. And uh, you have to add it one piece at a time. So how to do it, um, like I said, the, using the DOD model that's available inside of the AMP file itself is a really good way to learn about what's there and figure out how to use it to uh, set up a new aspect. So like I said, you basically just create a new aspect. Um, you have to add a bootstrap context for the aspect then, so it's similar to how you bootstrap a model. And then you add the, uh, the share form so that it displays in the, the uh, metadata appropriately. So it's basically just a couple of steps. So here's an example of one that I made. And uh, it, one thing to know is a tip. If you define a custom type, what you should not do is call it RM custom because that's already been used internally by Alfresco, even though that's not very obvious. And you'll get some errors if you try to uh, load your model with a, a, a namespace of RM custom. So basically, you can see I've just made one here that's called employee record, and it's got a parent of the record metadata. And uh, so that tells RM that this is a new aspect that I can use. So once I load that model into the memory, it uh, shows up here. And you can see now there's a fifth entry when I uh, have my file uh, dialog that uh, I use to load my metadata or my file into the system, rather. OK. So now let's talk about the file plans itself. So the file plan is the big uh, data structure that sort of you is used by uh, all of records management. So it's the essentially the root structure that's used to store content into the, uh, the content store itself. You can have multiple record categories, as many as you like, and you can put disposition schedules on any category. If you define a disposition schedule, it will inherit downward until it finds another one, and then that one gets uh, overwritten and replaces the higher level one. And then you can define record folders and put records into the folders, um, and that can extend to any level, essentially. So you can have another uh, set of uh, <coughs> structure defined like this. And this wasn't possible in the old product, so this is the sort of the primary benefit of the new release. But uh, as I said, it's been changed underneath in such a way that it's very, very um, extensible to uh, add a lot of new features, and, and we're working very hard on a 2.1 release that'll have a lot of uh, other interesting tricks. 
So to specify a file plan, you can go into the repository itself and you can start creating uh, categories and folders just like you would in the normal uh, repository browser. Um, as I said, a category can contain a disposition schedule and uh, they inherit downwards. So you can set up the files and categories manually and then you can export it as an ACP file and import it if you need to keep the structure. Or an even cooler thing is uh, now we've set it up so you can specify the structure as an XML file and uh, we'll have a loader available in the next version of the product, the 2.1 version product, that will actually be able to read the XML file and automatically create the structure for you. And there's actually an example of that in the DOD code as well. And it's actually pretty instructive to look at that example because it shows how a lot of things are specified and how a lot of things work. So um, here's an example of the XML itself. So uh, here's a category that's defined. This is part of the DOD uh, definition. So if you look in the DOD definition, you'll see a, a, a category called civilian files. And uh, you can see you can, you can add different types of uh, metadata to the, the category there. And then you can also define contained um, references or contained containers. So this particular category has another category called employee performance system records. And so that's what, there's a picture of what that looks like. So the, the uh, civilian files is up at the top there and you can see the employee performance records are uh, shown right there. So an additional thing is how you specify a disposition schedule. So the, uh, the disposition schedule, as I showed you earlier in the, the model, is uh, linked to the category through an aspect called scheduled. So you set an aspect up that's uh, on the category itself, and then you can define an association to a disposition schedule through that aspect. So the uh, disposition schedule data is here. And then you can actually add some action definitions at the bottom. And there's actually a longer list for this particular category, but I didn't have room to put the whole thing on the slide. So this allows you to specify pretty much exactly how the, the uh, category will be held and how it will be processed. So you can um, set these up and it'll create this structure along with all the disposition schedules for you automatically. So here's another picture of uh, what that looks like. Here's the disposition schedule for the, the uh, category we just saw. And uh, so the disposition schedule shows up as the, the uh, green steps here. So that cutoff that we saw on the previous page is actually that step right there is how that gets defined. An additional way to do that is to specify it manually so you can open up one of the uh, files and then you can press the button there that says uh, create a disposition schedule and you'll get, basically get the same type of form where you can go in and uh, add those things manually. Another cool thing about the new records management uh, product is it uh, allows you to save searches for content. That's a fairly important feature so that you can reproduce uh, searches that you need to get to different pieces of content that you have cataloged. And uh, you can actually pre-configure those and save them as part of the configuration. So uh, the way that works is there's a JSON data list that is set up as part of uh, a bean definition. And so you can go in, you can prototype the search definition that you want to. Then you just capture the search string and uh, you can set up a piece of JSON that has that exact search string in it and you can tell it which objects you would like it to apply to. Um, and you apply that in a, a uh, spring bean definition called RM service context. 
So this is what that looks like. The, uh, you can see there's actually a bunch of other stuff that's in this bean configuration, but the, uh, the operational part is this thing where it says reports JSON. So you can give it a name, and then the name will show up in the user interface for the users. You give it a search string, which is the other thing that's highlighted there. And then you can tell it some parameters, which are some things that you can check off in the user interface to uh, define which things you would like to have it filter against. So there's a couple of definitions there. The way that shows up in the user interface is that it shows up at the bottom of the file plan down here. So if you add some additional configurations, those will show up there. And uh, then users can actually pick them directly from there to use them. So here's another example that has sort of the same type of thing. This has a fairly, or a more complicated search string. And uh, note the search parameters here at the bottom with its records and records folders. And then this is the uh, RM search page. So you can see there that the query text that was on the previous um, definition shows up in, the, in there when I select it. So the top of this is actually a drop down over on the other side, there's a button there that allows me to select one of the save searches from a list of searches. When I select the save search, it loads this dialog actually. So uh, you, it puts the query string into the query text box there. And then the other two parameters show up on the other side where it says components there. So um, the cool thing about this is it actually shows some pretty interesting techniques if you're actually trying to program something. You can go in and see how it pulls the JSON definition back, how it loads this uh, metadata page. So if you're looking for a good place to, to see some modern techniques that are what we would consider to be best practice implementations for user interfaces, this is a great place to look because uh, it actually shows a lot of different ways to manipulate data that comes from the server and how to um, use them in the context of share. Let's see. So finally, um, we have a new thing called user capabilities, and this is something we may be spreading into the, the core uh, product at some point. So what a capability is, is this. As you add users to Al Alfresco, you can associate them to a role, which is like associating them to a group in the, the standard DM product. Then the roles have user capabilities that are defined to them. So before I take an action in the user interface, there's a list of capabilities that I can check to see if the user actually should be able to do that particular thing. And it's a little bit different than like an ACL, since the ACL really just controls permission. This actually controls actions as to whether a user can do them or not. So it's kind of an interesting thing. So um, right now you can declare the capabilities as spring beans, and there are uh, quite a few of these defined, uh, probably on the order of 50 or 60 capabilities. The, uh, they can be customized by going and uh, doing some things to the spring bean. You can see here, here's a definition that shows uh, how, the, how the bean is set up. And basically what you can do is you can go in here and say, um, I'd like to define some additional preconditions for somebody being able to do a record declaration. So, um, in this case, the default is that you can't have a uh, record that's frozen um, when you declare it, but you can go in and add some additional capabilities in as uh, preconditions. 
However, whoops, I see I got that slide backwards. However, the capability list right now is kind of fixed. We don't have a very good way to put them in yet and have them show up in the user interface, but we are working on that. So at some point, you'll actually be able to declare capabilities as well. And then, uh, so you can, do, like I said, you can change the behavior of them and uh, override them in the, the uh, definition there. Finally, um, we've done quite a bit of work, or Roy's done quite a bit of work, in terms of setting up all of the capabilities of records management as service declarations. So you can call them from other pieces of Alfresco and do things. So here's a list of some of the services. There's actually a records management service. Um, you can declare things as what's called a vital record, which means that that's something that uh, is very core to the, the business. And then there's also a service for dispositions. There's a service for the search, which you could actually leverage if you wanted to, to uh, try to put save searches into uh, share, I believe. Then there's some uh, capability and security services, as we just talked about. There's an uh, action and event service, as we talked about. And then there's uh, some other miscellaneous services here that have more to do with uh, RM. So, um, so what did we learn? Well, it's uh, RM 2.0 is a lot more customizable than the older product. And uh, when we get to the 2.1 release, it'll be even more customizable than it is now. Um, you can also configure a lot of the piece parts of it if you uh, go digging around inside of the uh, uh, RM AMP. I would use the DOD implementation as an example of how to set up a custom model and uh, how to set up a uh, file plan as well. And we're writing a developer's guide, which should be available in the next month or two, I would hope, um, so that you can actually have some examples and uh, tips on how to customize RM if you would like to. So anybody have any questions about that? for cloud and for the community as well. I, do you know the answer to that, Roy? Um, uh, so, and so RM201 will work on the current uh, community release. Um, so going forward, that will be a common pattern. We'll release versions that are um, uh, enterprise in quality, but will work on a community base, if that makes sense. Um, in terms of the cloud, we don't have any definite plans, but I suspect once we get past 2.1 and we have the in-place record management stuff, then we may start to look at that. OK. Did, did everybody see the Roy's presentation on 2.1 that he just referenced a second ago? The, uh, so what, what he referred to there, in case you don't know what that meant, the in-place records management, it, it, so in the current um, paradigm, you actually have to move a file into <laughs> records management in order for it to be managed by the RM system. But with our next release, you'll be able to leave it where it is and declare it as a record. And then uh, you can use all of the records management capabilities without having to, uh, to move your content around. So that'll be a really cool thing. Any other questions? All right, well, thanks very much. Thanks.